Okay, this is my friend from Hawaii, uh, John, and he's asked questions before and responded, and so I know his name's John because of a response in an email, and he says, I have a question for Pastor. I've been watching Pastor Steve Anderson, and sometimes he will talk about the rapture. The verse he always uses to disprove the pre-trib rapture is Matthew 24, 29 through 31. Could you explain Matthew 24? Okay, um, well, let me look it up and we'll see. Uh, the the rapture is not taught in Matthew chapter 4, first of all. It's not where the scripture makes very plain. First Thessalonians chapter 4 makes very clear about the rapture. Matthew 24 is dealing with a lot of tribulation events which are following the rapture. And uh, the the book of Revelation makes is a chronological book which if you study Revelation, you'll find that the church is gone before the tribulation begins. And then you see Christ coming and um, judging the world. You see his kingdom. And then you see ultimately the, the final rebellion and God's dealing with Satan on a final level and casting death and hell and the Satan and the lake of fire and, um, and uh, the world being perfect from there on out, new heaven and a new earth being created. I'm going to read Matthew chapter 24, and my eye goes immediately to verse 21, which says, For then shall there be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake uh, these days shall be shortened. Well, this is in the context of Jesus when he's in the Mount of Olives, and he's teaching his disciples, and I haven't looked at this ahead of time, but let me see if I can put some jumbling thoughts together and put them in their context so we can understand that we are talking about the tribulation and uh, that the signs of the times or the, the answer to when the things be that Matthew 24 is talking about the tribulation. Jesus said in verse 38 of Matthew 23, Behold, your house is left and you desolate, for I say unto you that ye shall not see me henceforth till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. So we know that Jesus was going to uh, have a time when he's going to come and these individuals are going to worship him appropriately. And he's talking about Jerusalem, who's killed the prophets. Um, we're not going to usher in uh, Jerusalem's turning to Jesus Christ. Well, in verse 20, chapter 24 and verse 1, Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple, and Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So he's talking about the destruction of the temple, of which we are already looking back to as a past event. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, what shall these things be, and what shall be the signs of thy coming and of the end of the world? Now, this is not a question of when Jesus is going to come and take his uh, saints to heaven. The question is, when are you going to judge the world? When, are the, uh, when is Jerusalem going to have to come to you and uh, turn from her rebellion? When is the temple going to be cast down? And when are these abominations, these judgments going to happen? And so the disciples were not asking Jesus, when are you going to come? By the way, when Jesus comes the second time, he's coming as the judge of the world. We know from the scripture that when Jesus comes and calls up the saints, the First Thessalonians 4 and 5 account, uh, chapter 4 talks about his taking those which are sleeping in Jesus Christ. Uh, when Jesus comes, he's not, his feet aren't going to touch the ground. He's not coming to this earth as judge. He's going to come to the, from the sky and call us up, rapture us up, so call us up to Him. We're going to meet the Lord in the air and be with the Lord. And so that's not the second coming of Christ. The second coming of Christ is when He comes to judge, and we see the description of those events in the Revelation. And so I don't know what this individual that you're referring to teaches about there not being a rapture, but Matthew 24 isn't talking about the rapture, it's talking about the tribulation and the signs of the tribulations coming. Now the comfort in that and the way that we're supposed to comfort ourselves with the tribulation is that we are not uh, of, of the darkness that that day should overtake us as a thief. 
What does that mean? It means we're saved. It means that the day of the Lord, the day of the judgment, the day of Christ, the, those days which are the second coming of Jesus Christ are not for believers because believers will not be here. I'll go ahead and read that in First Thessalonians and we'll expound just briefly upon it. It really is a very simple study. But uh, again, the answer to the question, John, is that Matthew 24 is not talking about the, the, uh, about Jesus Christ rapturing the saints. And so this individual that would say that he doesn't believe in the rapture, well, I don't believe Matthew 24 is talking about the rapture either. But um, just because it doesn't talk about the rapture does not mean the rapture is not an event in the timeline of Christ working in earth. I could tell you uh, thousands upon thousands of things that are biblical that are not found in Matthew chapter 24. And that does not mean that those events aren't in the rest of the scripture. It's that Matthew chapter 24 is talking about the tribulation and when Christ judges the earth. And so to say that something doesn't exist because it's not in a particular place is uh, nonsense and foolishness. It exists in other places in the scripture and exists in its place. And so you find the snatching up or the calling up of believers physically, bodily, to meet the Lord in the air, you find that in another place. In that place, one of those places is First Thessalonians and uh, chapter 4. And so I'll uh, turn in the scripture to that. By the way, First Thessalonians delineates very plainly the difference between the day of judgment or the day of the Lord and the coming of Christ as well. And so I'm glad for that. First Thessalonians chapter 4 and... Uh, in verse uh, four, 13, Paul's answering a confusing question that the believers at Thessalonica have, and of course believers have had throughout time. The question is, what about those people that believed in Jesus who have physically died, or as the scripture talks about in the New Testament, about people who are saved who sleep in Jesus? The scripture is very plain. These people have not died, but they are asleep. And so verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians 4 says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. And I'm glad for that. God doesn't want us to be without knowledge of this. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. And so don't be worried about these folks that you've lost, these loved ones that you're afraid haven't gone to heaven because they missed the coming of Jesus. But he says... For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and that is an if statement saying, do you believe that Jesus died and rose again? And the answer to that is, yes, we believe that. If that's true, then this must also be true. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus shall Christ bring with him. And so Jesus has brought the people that have slept in him with him. It's not soul sleep. Jesus has led paradise, led captivity uh, captive, and he has taken those individuals up to God. The finished work of the cross has made it so that man doesn't have to be separated from God at all, but to be absent from the body is present with the Lord. And that's what he is comforting the believers with in 1 Thessalonians 4. Now he's going to describe what's going to happen to those that are not sleeping in Jesus when Jesus calls us up. In verse 14, uh, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. In verse 15, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. And this is wonderful because the Apostle Paul has God's authority uh, and, and he understands that he is speaking on behalf of God by the Spirit of God. Uh, it, the, a little aside is that those individuals that God used to pen Scripture knew that God was moving them to do so. And I think that's wonderful. Well, we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. And if you'll look up prevent, and I happen to have a Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary beside me, so I'll look up what the word and the language at the time would prevent would have been understood to mean. So let's see here. I'm in PR presumptuousness. That's interesting, but not what we're looking for. Prevalence. Prevalently. Aha. Uh -huh. Prevent. Um, to go before or to proceed. That's the number one dictionary. Um, psalm. Uh, what's CXIX? Whatever that psalm is. What's that? 119? 
No. I'm bad with Roman numerals. Look at how ignorant I am. Well, I prevented the dawning of the morning and cried. And then number two definition for prevent. As used contemporaneously with the translation of the scripture that we use, the King James Version, to proceed as something unexpected or unsought. Uh, three, to go before. To proceed to favor by anticipation or by hindering distress or evil. So a lay person can just take an 1828 dictionary of the uh, of the English language and understand that the word prevent it means to precede or to go ahead of. So we're not going to get to heaven before those individuals which have already slept in Jesus. They beat us there, uh, rascals. Well, um, verse 16 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And the idea of shall rise is a shall have risen first concept with it. In other words, Jesus is going to descend, but he's not going to come in his second coming. He's not going to put his feet on the ground. Verse 17 says, here is what's going to happen when he descends. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And so we're speaking of a descending of Christ in which his descent is halted by our meeting him in the air. And so again, this is not Jesus coming and touching down on the ground and judging the earth. So we're told this is a comforting teaching doctrine, wherefore, because of this, comfort one another with these words. And so, John, I uh, want to comfort you by telling you Jesus is coming. We're going to meet him in the air, and uh, we do not have to be afraid about judgment. Now we talk about the day of the Lord. And now verse 5, when, when is judgment coming? When is, uh, when is the rapture? The answer to that we know from the scripture, Mark 13, for example, that no man knows when Jesus Christ is going to come. But now in chapter 5, he begins to talk about the day of the Lord. Uh, but of the times and seasons. So we've talked about the coming of Christ, the descending of Christ to call his saints up. But Jesus never touches the ground. That's not the second coming. In verse 1 of chapter 5 of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Well, that's interesting. Why don't brethren need to know about the day of judgment and when that's going to be? Well, here's why. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. You say, well, Pastor Price, uh, it's going to surprise us. No, it's not going to surprise us, and we're going to see that. For when they shall say, peace and safety... Again, the word they is a non-inclusive word. It would be a we if it included believers, but it doesn't include believers. It, in, it is speaking of the lost. It says, when they shall say, speaking of those that are not saved or in rebellion against God, whom he'll judge in the day of the Lord. When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. And again, we're not worried about it. We're comforted. Uh, we don't have any need that we be written about those things because why? Well, because the tribulation's not for us. That's why. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness. Again, they, now we're back to you, uh, who are a different group or category than those that are unbelievers and that are going to be surprised by the judgment of God. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness at that day, speaking of the day of the Lord, the day of judgment, should overtake you as the thief. Ye are all children of the light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep, as do others, but let us watch and be sober. And again, we're supposed to watch. What are we supposed to watch for? Well, we're supposed to watch for Jesus to call us up to meet him in the clouds. And that day of judgment won't overtake those individuals that are caught up, snatched up, or the Latin word, raptured. And... Uh, Friend, I'm glad to give you this good news, and I trust that you'll make it a careful, conscientious study of the Scripture. Uh, I, uh, I, I, I don't recommend that you uh, listen to a preacher that would contradict the plain teaching of the Scripture. Thank you uh, for asking me the question, and I hope that that's a help. Be, uh, feel free to follow up if you have any further questions.